Good afternoon, everyone. A uh, very warm welcome to session two of the TCAS 2021 conference. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Jennifer Paxton. I'm from the University of Edinburgh. So I'm delighted to welcome you to Edinburgh this year, albeit virtually, of course. Uh, so this session is sponsored by Biotech. And within this session, we're going to have an exciting keynote followed by a series of turbo talks. So the first thing I'm going to do is to, to introduce our first speaker. So I'm delighted to welcome Kareen Coulomb to deliver our keynote in this session. Kareen is currently Associate Professor of Engineering at Brown University. She's got a background in biomedical engineering at the University of Rochester, and she completed her PhD at the University of Washington in 2007. So after a period of postdoctoral work, uh, again at Washington, she moved to Brown University in early 2014 as an assistant professor of engineering and medical science. Karine has had numerous prestigious awards throughout her career so far, and she was most recently awarded uh, the NSF Career Award. So today she's going to talk about her group's research in customised biomaterials for heart regeneration with engineered myocardium. So uh, welcome Karine, and it's over to you. Hello, can you hear me? Great. And can you see my slides? Is that a yes, Jennifer? Yes. Great. Well, good morning, everyone. I'm delighted to be with you uh, today. Uh, my name is Kareen Coulomb. I'm an associate professor of engineering in the Center for Biomedical Engineering at Brown University. And I'm going to share with you work today that my group is doing to customize biomaterials for heart regeneration with our human engineered myocardium. And my lab is really interested in developing novel therapeutics for heart regeneration um, and for cardiovascular disease. As you can see, cardiovascular disease increases with age and it's the leading global cause of mortality. In fact, one out of three deaths is due to cardiovascular disease and the World Health Organization has called this a global epidemic. Um, one out of every two deaths is due to ischemic heart diseases, makes up about half of all cardiovascular disease. And this occurs when there is a blockage of blood flow in a coronary artery um, due to an atherosclerotic plaque. This causes ischemia in the downstream tissue and within minutes the cardiomyocytes will die. Um, most patients that present in the emergency room will get revascularization therapy. So they go to the cath lab and they get this blockage opened up um, by a balloon catheter and sometimes also stenting. And so they get reperfusion. However, that tissue that dies and those cardiomyocytes are replaced by scar. Um, so you can see scar labeled in sort of the pink color, which is a picoserious red stain for collagen. And um, you can see that this is the midwall scar. This image comes from a rat uh, in my lab that has received 60 minutes of ischemia followed by reperfusion. And if you look at the border of this scar, it is um, heterogeneous in its structure and, and form. And this reflects the human uh, condition where there is interdigitating muscle and scar. And so we use this model um, to more closely replicate uh, sort of the clinical condition instead of a permanent ligation model. We do this at four weeks because um, we want to see a more uh, durable regeneration. And we know that uh, MI uh, causes progressive heart failure. And so heart failure is classified by these progressive stages and, and patients that present with heart failure um, are put on, on different regimens of diet as well as uh, pharmaceuticals. And globally, there are 26 million uh, people diagnosed with heart failure, and almost half of these have reduced ejection fraction. Half of those cases are, have a history of myocardial infarction. And so there's really a critical need to develop novel therapeutics to restore contractility and enhance cardiac output. Because if you see um, in these late stages, stage D or class four heart failure, really patients progress to um, needing a ventricular assist device or heart transplantation. And there's no support for the muscle of their own heart. 
So uh, the field of heart regeneration and heart repair has been using biomaterials and tissue engineering approaches for many years now. Um, and you can see the benefits of having biomaterials include things like promoting a, a better remodeling of the heart and inducing vascularization. Here in this image, you can see vessels encoded with um, endothelial cells in red and smooth muscle cells in green. And so these can use things like native extracellular matrix and, and biomaterials can be used to deliver bioactive molecules for better healing. Uh, the field also delivers cells and tissues. Um, and this, the major goal here is really to replace the cardiomyocytes uh, that were lost due to that ischemia. So there um, are you know, multiple cell types that have been used in the past. However, much research now is focused on using human embryonic stem cell and human induced pluripotent stem cell derived cardiomyocytes. And these are in engineered tissues um, or directly injected into the, the wall of the injured heart. And you can see engraftment of human muscle here in a macaque model. So my goal uh, with my research program is to combine these heart repair approaches and use um, a number of different biomaterials to support the cells and the engineered tissues that we're engrafting into hearts. And so on the left, you can see sort of the different uh, biomaterials that we've been developing. And we do use the human-induced pluripotent stem cell-derived cardiomyocytes in engineered tissues. And now we also use heterogeneous cell types such as cardiac fibroblasts and sometimes endothelial cells um, as well as leveraging uh, interaction with the host and host cells. So we engineer our tissues with these human iPSC-derived cardiomyocytes, and we're using um, the chemically defined uh, culture conditions and uh, small molecule activation and inhibition of the wind pathway to drive differentiation. We promote proliferation to expand that population, and we use a metabolic-based selection to purify uh, the population for cardiomyocytes. And you can see that we get um, nice beating cells that are striated, labeled here with alpha actinin. And we have high purities over 80% um, and often upwards of 90, 95% cardiomyocytes by flow cytometry analysis. And also this lactate, uh, you know, uh, media that we use to purify the cells also induces a more mature metabolic phenotype. So when we do a seahorse assay to look at oxygen consumption rate um, and its ratio with the extracellular acidification rate, we see an increase in that ratio suggesting that there is increased oxidative phosphorylation in these uh, cardiomyocytes. And we've developed a simple uh, way to create molds using um, just a vector graphics file and laser etching in acrylic where we can create um, a, a mold out of polydimethylsiloxane. We mix um, the cardiomyocytes and other cells with a hydrogel in order to mold it um, to create our engineered human cardiac tissue. And this is such an easy way of creating different molds is that, uh, that we can use it um, and, and re reproduce many different molds in a single afternoon. Um, and you can see sort of, uh, this is a, from a paper that we published in 2017 describing this method where we can make linear tissues if we're looking at mechanical measurements and force and contractility um, or different designs for implants. Uh, this middle one in the bottom is what I'll show you that we've been using in our wrap model of MI. So this is an engineered tissue made from one of those such molds, and it has 10 million cardiomyocytes in a collagen one hydrogel. And they uh, compacted the hydrogel and formed a syncytium, so an electric, a continuous electrical um, tissue, and it's beating spontaneously here. You can see um, the posts were elongated, and so they created these holes in the tissue. And really what we're doing now, um, and what we've been publishing on recently, are the different hydrogels we've been using um, to form these tissues, thinking about how to make a fibrous scaffold to be able to replace the posts and give some um, architecture to the, the tissue. And then um, to be able to deliver angiogenic growth factors to get vascular uh, integration in vivo. 
So our study for optimizing hydrogel formulation was published in 2019. And what we've done is we've looked at fibrin and collagen as two hydrogel sources that are commonly used in the field and highly compatible with the IPS-derived cardiomyocytes. We used a design of experiments approach and came up with 13 groups where we could over um, time, over five days, take images of them to be able to look at compaction and culturing across all of these groups. We did our analysis and response surface modeling. And what we found was that um, a more compact tissue is going to create a more uniform syncytium and uniform beading. And so you can see here that the low fibrin concentration or without any fibrin gave us the greatest uh, compaction in the tissues or the smallest construct area. And when we measured mechanics in these tissues, the stiffness um, was highest in the zero fibrin group and uh, you can see the points that we measured are in red and the surface is the model that fit to the data. And the force that we measured or the peak twitch stress um, was maximum also along this edge, but contrary to stiffness, which was highest at a high collagen concentration, the peak twitch force was predicted to be highest at a lower collagen concentration. Um, again, these are the data points in the middle at 1.2 mg per mole collagen that we measured. And um, we actually created this group. And what we found was that um, the tension created by the cardiomyocytes actually caused necking and breakage in half of the engineered tissues. And so uh, while the model predicted that to be a high point, it was not uh, actually feasible. So, we determined from this study that we needed greater than 60% pure cardiomyocytes um, with our given seeding density and 1.2 mg per mil collagen. And our formulation now includes 5% cardiac fibroblasts, um, which is a recently published paper uh, just last year. Um, in order to be able to provide some uh, geometric cues for elongation and orientation of the cardiomyocytes, we had been using posts and now we're moving to microfibers. Um, so we're using a, a technique called wet spinning to create collagen microfibers. And what we do is we have a high concentration of collagen that is fed in through this tube and surrounded by a high viscosity buffer solution so that as it moves through this spinneret, it gets um, formed into coaxial flow that goes through about a meter of tubing and exits into um, a ethanol bath to dry. We're going to use some robotics controlled through a microcontroller and we feed those fibers through a guide that then can go on to a mandrel to collect meshes that are programmed through the microcontroller, which controls two motors, one that causes rotation of the mandrel and the other that causes uh, lateral translation. We've done some mechanics on these single fibers um, in a heated and aqueous um, bath in our lab. And we've mounted these fibers between two washers and put them in our setup. And we incubated them prior to testing um, in a saline solution, so a salt solution, um, because this collagen is a full length collagen molecule that has the end groups. And so um, potentially an ability to self-assemble. And we know that um, collagen is great under tension in the body, for example, um, with uh, tendons that are pulled in tension off often. And so um, we found that the Young's modulus increased with incubation time, as did the ultimate tensile strength and strain at break. Um, this was not to the same extent as you get with other uh, treatments to cross-link um, collagen. However, it was really exciting for us to take a look um, here by serial block-based imaging to be able to find fiber formation and by TEM, um, the characteristic debanding that you find, suggesting that there is self-assembly and that what we provided were these building blocks that really the body could be able to use these to um, remodel and, and sort of, uh, you know, basically uh, renew its, its scaffold um, from these templated uh, fibers. So we uh, looked at some metrics of the patterning, such as their uh, diameter and the width. Um, and then we were able to capture these me meshes, plug the bottom, and then create this mold that fits in the well of a six well plate. Um, we then can inject the cells in hydrogels. 
um, to be able to uh, create tissues. And upon hydration, you can see some swelling of the fibers, and then after three days, this, the cells will compact into a tissue. Um, we did mechanics in the transverse and longitudinal direction on these fibers, and what we found was that um, we could get a different stiffness based on the fiber angle, here showing for 30 degrees and 60 degree fibers. And the ratio of these stiffnesses um, actually captures that that is found in the native myocardium. So we could create these tissues, majority of our cells were alive, shown by the green stain here, and we stained with alpha actinin to be able to look at the myofibrils within the cardiomyocytes. And if I blow up this image, you can see uh, here are some very nice striations that did in fact align with the direction of the fibers, and this did make the, the cover image of tissue engineering Part C methods uh, back in 2019. So we've continued this work and we're looking at different architectures, for example, parallel and 30 degree meshes, as well as no fibers, um, which was our original engineered tissue uh, with just the hydrogels. And we can find that you know, compaction is not as great when you have parallel fibers or even the 30 degree fibers because these fibers are providing additional stiffness. And so we decreased the concentration of the hydrogel itself um, to be able to make sure that we got good compaction at this 30 degree uh, angle. And we're continuing this study to look at the stiffness and the mechanics of contractility. So finally, I wanted to describe to you a study that we've done to customize our biomaterials for vascularization in vivo. And really the goal here is to create a composite tissue that can induce native vascular ingrowth to a greater extent to create a perfused vascular bed within the implanted engineered tissue. So to do this, we embedded alginate microspheres that were loaded with growth factors into our engineered tissue, implanted them on uh, injured rat hearts, and then we did perfusion at sacrifice to be able to um, get a 3D reconstruction of the vessels and look at where the host vasculature penetrated into the implant. So in order to look at release of uh, our growth factors from these alginate microspheres, again, this is unmodified alginate, um, we used a uh, labeled biotinylated VEGF um, loaded in the microspheres, and we looked at this time course of release. And you can see um, from the uh, Western blot, and then here quantified that over three days, we get all of our protein released. And we assessed what the effect of this release would be on a heterocellular uh, in vitro model of a sort of vascular um, outgrowth, which is this aortic ring model that we've modified to put on a collagen gel where there are microspheres beneath it. And we looked at out outgrowth of cells from these aortic rings. And you can see from the ring, there is this web-like structure growing out and embedded underneath uh, the, or within the gel are some microspheres here shown with these arrows. So we loaded these microspheres with uh, different combinations of um, uh, basic fibroblast growth factor, sonic hedgehog, and vascular endothelial growth factor in dual and triple combinations at low and high concentrations. And we compared these to a negative control, so a basal medium stripped of those growth factors here in gray, or positive control, a complete medium that had all of those growth factors in it. And you can see that a number of groups were um, performing just as well as the positive control. And that included a dual combination of FGF and sonic hedgehog, as well as uh, some of these triple combinations of VEGF, FGF, and sonic hedgehog at high concentration, which is the group that we ended up using. We used lectin to label the endothelial cells that were coming out of the uh, aortic rings, and we could see that there were three-dimensional structures of these uh, coming out of the rings and into the collagen gel. So what we did was we um, uh, implanted these in athymic rat hearts that had undergone a myocardial ischemia reperfusion injury. And four days later, we produced the constructs so that there would be as much growth factor in the microspheres as possible and implanted them on the same day within six hours. And then um, we looked at some uh, uh, hearts by histology um, at seven days and the majority of them at about one month. 
And what we had was we had sham groups that had no implant, an implant with only cells, an implant with the microspheres, but no growth factors. So that was an unloaded group. And then the loaded microspheres with all three growth factors in the engineered tissues. So what we found um, was that the cardiomyocytes were robustly engrafted on the epicardial surface. Um, and at seven days and at 30 days, the grafts were consistent in size. There was no statistical difference. And we could find um, in, in the implant at um, early and, and later time points, um, some nice elongating cardiomyocytes. Um, in looking at whole heart function by echocardiography, at the one month time point, um, there was a statistically significant improvement in function um, when there were the uh, unloaded and loaded uh, microspheres in the engineered tissues. This was not due to a change in infarct size because there was no difference in infarct size. And when we looked at the endothelial cells labeled here by RECA1, um, we quantified their density um, in the remote healthy tissue, in the, in the infarct, and then also in the cardiac tissue. And what we found was that, um, the, as expected, the infarct had much lower vascular density than the healthy remote tissue. Um, and the cardiac tissue had low vascular density as well. But this was improved when um, we went from an unloaded to a growth factor loaded microsphere. Um, so this was uh, very promising to suggest that the growth factor delivery had an impact on the vascular development. This is a two-dimensional metric from histological images, and this is often what we see in the literature. Uh, but we raised the bar, and what we did was we did perfusion at sacrifice with a radio-opaque um, dye called microfill. And we did uh, micro-CT imaging at a 10 micron voxel size. We then um, took histological images to be able to trace the infarct in multiple slices. Um, and then register that uh, with the micro CT images and also the implant on the epicardial surface. So then we could segment this 3D network, be able to look at sites of anastomosis or uh, rather uh, invagination of the vasculature into the engineered tissue. And then we quantified the vascular networks that were in the engineered tissue. What we found was that the number of networks per the volume of the tissue was increased in the loaded condition compared to the cells only condition shown here in this violin plot. And then also the diameter was increased in the loaded versus the unloaded condition. The number of branch nodes also increased when we had the growth factors uh, loaded into the microspheres. The distribution of uh, diameters of the vessels was not very different between groups at below 100 microns, but we did have some larger diameter uh, vessels in the growth factor loaded group. And uh, the, the number of branch nodes did proportionally increase and was no different between the groups um, with the increased length that we saw when we had uh, loaded uh, microspheres. It was really interesting to us to also find that the tortuosity of these three-dimensional reconstructed vessels in the implants was decreased. We know that tortuosity is inversely proportional to flow, and so we believe that you know, decreased tortuosity could lead to a better perfused uh, vascular bed uh, with greater flow velocities. That is to be determined as, as this was all done uh, at sacrifice and as a static uh, assessment. So where we're moving with this project is really to use some heparin-modified alginate biomaterials to slow the growth factor release. We recently published a study to look at VEGF released using um, either heparin-modified or also sulfate-modified alginate um, coming from bulk materials and microspheres. Um, but we're also moving to a bulk uh, sort of thin film application um, to be able to release the angiogenic biologics uh, because of the need to separate uh, the tissue engineering part with the cells and the hydrogels from the controlled release of the growth factors so that we can get sort of the timing right on the, on the day of, of repair and surgical implant. 
So finally, we're using um, alginate to make some fibers that we can pattern in our engineered tissues and then sacrifice to be able to create channels. And those channels we can endothelialize. Um, here's an example of channels formed in an, in an engineered tissue um, where then they're perfused with endothelial cells and uh, we can do some lovely imaging on them when we use just a sort of blank collagen hydrogel around them rather than the cardiomyocytes. We can see that we get confluence of these cells. You can get labeling of basement membrane that they are producing as well as seeing these VE cadherin cellular junctions around the endothelial cells. There is angiogenic sprouting from the channel um, showing some of these uh, tip and stalk type phenotypes of these angiogenic sprouts. And we do get sort of this confluent layer all the way around those channels. So this is sort of the next step of where we're taking this, this project. And in order to be able to assess this, um, we are going to be doing a, a few new imaging uh, techniques. And one is an ex vivo optical coherence tomography um, at uh, 14 days. And this is really to be able to look at smaller size vessels, vessels down to a capillary level. And um, continuing on with some of our uh, microfill perfusion, We've modified a, a MATLAB code that came from a group at Yale to be able to look at branching in the heart. Um, and this is color coded by branch level. And what we can see is that we can get branching all the way down into the implant. So in summary, we're customizing our biomaterials and uh, working to you know, re-engineer contractility in the heart, but we're looking at all biological length scales. So I hope you can appreciate that we take really great care of our cardiomyocytes and how we assemble the tissues for greatest functionality, and, and we take it to the whole heart level to be able to look at regeneration in vivo. Um, these customizations of the biomaterials are really to focus on the biological interactions and the outcomes to be able to cycle again and to redesign what we have for better regeneration. And we have a niche here in the field of regeneration because we're really working on a co-muscularization -muscul and revascularization strategy. And we're looking at a long-term and sort of holistic therapeutic solutions for heart repair after myocardial infarction. So with that, I'd like to acknowledge the group that has done all this work with me at Brown, um, as well as a number of our collaborators in the Cardiovascular Research Center um, and sort of around campus and around the world, um, as well as our funding sources. So I would be happy to take questions and thank you for your attention. Thank you so much. That that was absolutely wonderful. Okay, so um, uh, Jennifer, I am not able to hear you. Uh, so if I um, could have questions either typed to me or uh, sent in some other way. So can can you hear me now, Karine? Can you hear me now? So unfortunately we have some um, technical issues at the moment. So what we're going to suggest is that the questions could be uh, taken through okay, the- Okay, now I'm seeing some, some questions. The, the Q&A, so- um, We can control the release by architecture of the scaffolds. Um, we have thought about that. Uh, it's a very good point. So could you control the spatial release? And as we know, in vivo, there's a gradient of, for example, uh, VEGF that induces uh, angiogenic sprouting. Um, I think that we could uh, do some patterning like that in our engineered tissues. We're getting more and more control over spatial patterning. Um, so it's a great idea. You know, the, the uh, channel patterning that we've been doing recently um, is based on the idea that uh, we need a, a greater number of large vessels to really get con uh, convective flow into the engineered tissue to make sure that it's efficiently perfused. But I think that's a great idea.
Ah, question about the fiber scaffolds and, and these composites. Did you find the fiber architecture impacted the cell response? Yes, as we got to steeper and steeper angles, um, it was much more difficult for the cells to compact the, the hydrogel. And then it meant it was more difficult to form a syncytium. And so uh, in essence, what that meant was that was one reason why we decreased the hydrogel concentration so that the cells as they're trying to pull on their matrix to compact the, the hydrogel and also therefore compact the fibers that they would have sort of less resistance um, in order to, to create uh, engineered tissue that was fully compact. Um, and the, the architecture is something that we're still looking at now. So we're looking at things like how close do the cardiomyocytes need to be for their myofibrils to align with the uh, fibers themselves? Um, there has been some evidence in the literature that 100 microns is, is a good spacing, and, and we've been patterning at 200 micron spacing. So, so ideally, we're trying to get cells close enough to fibers that every cell in the tissue can actually sense um, a, a fiber and a direction to be able to orient with it. We're also trying to get multiple layers of those fibers. We've done up to four layers, but you could imagine uh, right now the thickness is limited by diffusion of nutrients, but if we could pattern other ways into perfusing and, and getting nutrients into the interior of the tissue, we could go thicker than that. Great, so thank you so much. That was an absolutely wonderful presentation. And um, we're just going to continue with uh, the rest of the session now. Um, any more questions that you have for Karine, they could be answered in the, the Q&A at a later date. So we're going to move on to the flash, the flash talks now, or the turbo talks, as they are called in this session. And we have a series of these, which are going to be four minutes long each. So all the presenters have four minutes. And uh, we're not going to have individual questions after each talk. We're going to have a collective Q&A session at the end. So what I'll say now is that if you have particular questions for the speakers, please put them in the chat, but use the speaker's name so that we know um, who your question is addressed to, and then we'll revisit them at the Q&A at the end. So I'd like to introduce our first one of our Turbo Talks. That's Bowen Z from the University of Kiel. And he's going to talk about the characterization of foam cell models using a label-free technique toward better atherosclerosis investigation. For the introduction, so I'm going to present my slide. Hi, everyone. I'm honored to give the first short turbo talk in the session. What I'm going to do is to use the synchrotron-based FTIR as a novel label-free application. So first of all, all we know the macrophage is one of the key types in the pathogenesis of atherosclerosis. Once exposed to the atherogenic liver protein, turn into foam cells, which are lipid-laden cells created through the excessive influx of modified low-density lipoprotein. And the statins are the most commonly used drugs for both the treatment and prevention of atherosclerosis. The recent studies suggest the ultravastatin enhanced the uh, cholesterol influx and decreased the cholesterol content in a dose-dependent manner. Um, so in this work, we demonstrate that ultravastatin is able to initiate and reverse the cholesterol transport in a dose-dependent manner, and we strongly suggest that the use of based micro-FTIR can become a reliable, label-free technique to study the osteosclerosis. In this study, we first generate the foam cells from marine macrophage cell line. The foam cells uh, were then incubated with ultravastatin at 0.6, 6, and 60 microgram per mil for 24 hours to investigate the effect of uh, on the FX, sorry, on the efflux uh, lipid. Then the dynamic efflux was studied by the incubating foam cells with 6 microgram per mil ultravastatin for 24, 48, and 72 hours. Then we started to span the fixed cell to the microscope cover slip at a thickness around 0.13 to 0.17 millimeter for cytospectral uh, scanning. Samples of the uh, slide, the fixed cells. 
Also, the media was collected for further measurements, and the rest of cells can be new red staining to support our FTR data. Uh, then the outcome of FTIR spectrum looked like the figure at the right top side, at least the spectrum. Uh, the quality of the spectrum was good with consistency, and by running full component analysis, as known as the PCA, we found that the spectrum showed very coherent clusters on the treatment with different ultraviolet dose, which is the right plot figure at a different incubation time, which is the left plot figure. So in this case, we successfully told the difference on the treated macrophages without any labeling. And for information, the cover slips are very cheap as well as the sample processing. Our cytokine secretion results and the staining images are also proving a significance and convincing the PCA clusters. Uh, the ultraviolet staining restricts foam cells nitric oxide production and triggered the RCT over time. So here we conclude. Uh, the FTIR single cell data correlates very well with the biological assays and can become a very promising but also very low cost label free technique. Um, so please visit my post and free to question me in, if interested. Thank you for watching. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, right, we'll move on to our next speaker now, who is Annabelle Fricker from the University of Sheffield. And she's going to talk to us about tissue engineered cardiac patches for the treatment of post MI heart failure using natural polymers and human iPSC derived cells. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, a little bit of background to my project, um, which was actually very nicely described by Corrine earlier. Um, and she described how cardiovascular diseases are the leading cause of death globally at around 31%. Um, and whilst the heart has very poor regenerative capacity, there are treatments to prevent um, myocardial infarction getting worse. Um, however, we don't really have a way of repairing the damage that is done by events such as myocardial infarction currently. So uh, in my PhD project, we propose a solution of a cardiac patch. This would be made from natural polymers um, with the aim of delivering living cardiac cells, both cardiomyocytes and endothelial cells to the area of scar tissue um, hopefully to restore some of the function of the heart um, and also its mechanical properties. So uh, the first of my natural polymers are polyhydroxyalkanoates. These are biocompatible and bioresorbable and they degrade within the body by surface erosion to produce um, products that are naturally found within the body. They have been FDA approved for a number of clinical applications. Um, and a great thing about them is that they are a really large family of polymers with a lot of variable properties. So the PHA in question that I will be using is um, here in the bottom right corner, poly 3 hydroxyoctanoate co 3 hydroxydecanoate And this is a very um, elastomeric PHA, um, therefore making it hopefully ideal for this cardiac muscle application. And these polymers are made by bacterial fermentation, so we um, aren't reliable, relying on any animal sources for this, um, and we think it produces a very reproducible product. Um, alongside this, I'll be using alginate, um, another um, a natural polysaccharide, again found to be biocompatible and non-immunogenic. Um, and it has also been found in previous literature that these alginate can be produced alongside PHAs in bacterial fermentations. So some initial results that I have that I would share with you today. Firstly, some cytotoxicity results uh, using C2C12 mouse myoblast cells. I firstly looked at a rosazarin assay to compare tissue culture plastic to both my PHA and also alginate with various crosslinkers. And what I found was that uh, my polymer actually performed better than TCP um, after days three and seven, and the alginate was didn't perform quite as well, um, was not significantly worse. 
I've then moved on to using uh, growing human induced pluripotent stem cells, as Karina was talking about as well, and have produced cardiomyocytes and endothelial cells from these. And here I have live dead images comparing them seeded onto a fibronectin coated um, plastic and also plastic with uh, my PHA films on them. Um, and whilst I am going to work on the seeding density and um, the uh, imaging quality through these films, you can see that there is a good amount of living cells, especially in comparison to the fibronectin. Um, further to this, I've also looked at uh, calcium transients. So loading these cells with flow four um, shows us how the calcium moves through a monolayer of cells and shows us the beat rate. And uh, Whilst more um, experiments of this need to be done to gather statistical data, so far it's looking as though um, the heart is the heart rate is a little quicker on my polymer samples. And so all of this um, comes together um, for our processing technique, which is 3D printing. Uh, as I said, I'm using PHAs and alginates, and we multi-material print these in alternating struts of each. Um, uh, PHA and alginate um, with struts going in one direction and then in a perpendicular, perpendicular direction to produce our patch. We've so far produced some acellular patches which have been sent to a collaborator for some in vivo assessment to check their um, suturability onto a mouse heart and also to check for biocompatibility in vivo. Um, and we're moving on this uh, next up our research is moving towards bioprinting, so encapsulating cells within the alginate. And here I have an initial experiment where I encapsulated C2C12 cells again within the alginate and we 3D printed them. And here I have just stained them with uh, phalloidin and DAPI to show the actin in nuclei. Um, and our next steps will be uh, to do the same, but with human-induced pluripotent stem cell-derived cardiomyocytes and endothelial cells. So thank you for listening to my very brief talk. I'd just like to thank uh, my supervisors at Sheffield Imperial College London and also the University of Navarra and um, the rest of my group under the supervision of Professor Ipshita Roy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Annabelle. <clears throat> Thanks, Annabelle. So, um, slight change to the running order, but we're next we're going to have Daisy Gow from the University of Edinburgh, and she's going to talk about topographically featured PCL electrospan scaffolds incorporating rat liver extracellular matrix for liver tissue engineering. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for introducing. Uh, I'm Yun Shiga from University of Edinburgh. Today I'm going to share my research, which is about the incorporation of decellularized electrocellular matrix to topographic featured electroscale scaffold for liver tissue engineering. Uh, liver disease is one of the leading cause of deaths in worldwide, which is the mortality is rising since 1970, while the other major disease is decreased. The whole organ transplantation is the only effective way to kill it. However, the donor liver is very limited. Uh, liver tissue engineering shows promise of treatment. We can design the scaffold in vitro, then grow the cells on it, then eventually turn to be the tissue. Then we can use that for repair or replace the damaged liver tissue or to do the disease modeling or drug testing. In my study, I use electrospinning technique to fabricate this scaffold. In order to know how the scaffold structure and the composition influence the cellular performance, I firstly made three different types of scaffold with the fiber with the large surface depression, small surface depression, and the no depression. Then we found the small surface depression fibers uh, can great promote the cell proliferation and also can keep the main typical gene expression at the same time. So we use this type of fiber to combine with the uh, red ECM. We harvested and deselled the whole red liver, then freeze dry it and make the ECM chloroform mixture. Then we are able to fabricate the constant microfiber with the ECM inside and on the surface, which is confirmed by the collagen staining of the scaffold. Here are the four type of, type of scaffold I made. 
uh, no depression, depression only, and uh, the scaffold with a set amount of ECM. The mechanical testing shows those scaffold has very similar mechanical properties, and we also did the uh, different uh, cell analysis like the cell viability DNA content and the typical gene expression. The results shows uh, um, all shows the all scaffold shows differences between the uh, scaffold and also between the ten points. Here are the cell immunofluorescence uh, result and osmium staining. The uh, the immunofluorescence pictures shows uh, the four different type of scaffold or produce the, the different type of proteins. And the osmium staining pictures shows the ECM scaffold tend to, uh, the cells tend to form a monolayer, uh, a monolayer of tissue on the day of 14, while the other scaffold shows more cell spreading. I would like to thank to the, everyone in my group and my supervisor, Dr. Anthony Kanana. If you are interested with my study, please come to my poster number 65. Thank you. Thanks, Daisy. Uh, right, our next speaker is from the University of Manchester, and we have Marlene Polares. Uh, she's going to speak about a neurovascular 3D cell model to investigate the role of pericytes in dementia. Hi, everyone. Thanks for inviting me to talk. Um, yeah, I'm doing my PhD at the University of Manchester, and I'm going to talk about um, my project, which is about investigating pericytes in dementia. Um, First of all, I need to ex explain a bit um, what the neurovascular unit is. Um, it's basically the interface between the cerebral blood flow, uh, the cerebral blood vessels, and the brain. Um, it's composed of multiple stereotypes, which you can see in the figure here. Um, but today, I'm only going to focus on the endothelial sites, which line the blood vessels, but also the, the parasites, uh, which uh, wrap the processes around the capillaries. And um, all of these cell types need to work together so that we have a normal cerebral blood flow and a normal blood brain barrier function. However, in um, dementia, including Alzheimer's disease, we see that this structure starts to dysfunction. And uh, we also see that parasites start to contract. And this actually happens much more early on than we see the neurodegeneration, which we usually see in dementia. Uh, but we still don't know what the cause of this is. Um, so. I use IPC-derived brain-specific parasites to investigate this a bit further. Uh, so I use this published protocol. And on the right-hand side, you can see that after this uh, differentiation protocol, I indeed get some mar parasite marker expressions, namely NG2, PDGFA-beta, CD13, and CD146. So I'm pretty confident that I get uh, parasite-like cells. And then I use these IPC-derived parasites and uh, study them in a blood-brain barrier. And for this, I use a transfer insert model uh, on which I grow the endothelial cells in a monolayer on top of uh, hydrogel. And the hydrogel gives me, first of all, a soft substrate to grow the cells on, but also it allows me to co culture other cell types like parasites in my case. And to evaluate if those um, cells form a proper monolayer and uh, have tight barrier functions, I use a measurement called tear measurement where you insert these two electrodes and then you can measure the resistance across the monolayer. And the higher the resistance, the less permeable the cell monolayer is, which is good because that's what we see in the brain as well. And it's non-invasive, so I can, can do this over multiple days in a row. And then you get a graph like this on the right hand side. Um, so I did this uh, in a co-culture with my IPC derived parasites and also the endothelial cells where I Hi, everyone. So un unfortunately, we had some technical issues sharing uh, that particular presentation. Um, so what I would suggest is that um, if you're interested in that work, now it sounded, it sounded um, excellent. There will be a recording of this, um, but there's there will also be a poster, I, I think, that you could visit. So you know, please, please do do that. We don't want technical issues to impact one one person in particular. Um, oh, excellent! So we've just I've just heard that we are going to play the recording now. 
So just stay, stay tuned and we will have this particular speaker's recording coming. Thank you. Multicellular structure, but in this talk, I will only focus on the endophilocytes and the parasites, which sit on top of the capillary blood vessels and are depicted in green here. All of these cell types need to function correctly in order to get a normal functioning blood flow and also blood brain barrier. However, in certain types of dementia, like Alzheimer's disease, this structure starts to dysfunction and parasites contract. This leads to leaking blood vessels and also impaired blood flow. This happens much earlier on as the neuropathology associated with dementia, but the cause of it is still not fully understood. To study the role of parasites within the NVU, I am using a published differentiation protocol, which gives brain-specific parasites. As you can see on the right-hand side, my IPC-derived parasites express the parasite markers NG2, BDGFA beta, CD13, and CD146. I then go on and use these parasites in an in vitro model of the blood brain barrier. For this, I use this transfer insert setup in which dendrophilus cells are grown on top of a hydrogel in a transfer. The hydrogel provides a soft substrate and also allows to co-culture other cell types within it, like parasites in my case. And it also allows us to measure the barrier function of the endophilia cells, which is called TIR, by inserting two electrodes and measuring the resistance across the cell monolayer. The higher the resistance, the lower the permeability of the endophilia cells, which is good as you may know that the brain endophilia cells are very tightly linked together. Initial experiments showed that the presence of parasites increased the barrier function of the endophilia cells, and I can now go on and study this further. So in summary, I was able to differentiate IPCs into parasites, which seem to improve the barrier function of the endophilia cells, and are also able to contract, which unfortunately I could not show in this short talk, but I'm happy to talk about this um, in my poster. And in the future, I want to investigate the contractility of parasites further and compare different mutations of Alzheimer's disease and look at parasite contraction and the endophilia barrier function. And with that, I want to thank my lab and everyone who helped me and thank you for your attention and I'm happy to take any questions. Excellent. Thank, thank you so much. Um, and thank you, everybody, for your patience while we got that recorded talk up on the platform for you. And I'll just at this point remind everybody that that these talks were, were whizzing through them quite quickly. But if you do have questions, there will be a Q&A session at the end. So please put your questions in the Q&A uh, for our speakers so that we can revisit them at the end. Right, let's move to our next speaker. And that's going to be Maria Luisa Hernandez Miranda from the University of Southampton. And she's going to talk about the thickness of soft hydrogel substrates modifies bone marrow stromal cell morphology and differentiation. So thank you, Maria. Uh, thanks for attending my presentation. Uh, I'm doing my PhD at the University of Southampton. Uh, investigating the effect of the geometry of the extracellular matrix in bone regeneration. Bone marrow stroma cells are used on scaffolds in bone regeneration where chemical but also mechanical properties, uh, signals, sorry, uh, are important for directing uh, cell behavior. Stem cells are able to exert force against the extracellular matrix and the stiffness is a property that describes how resistant to the formation is this structure. In the body, we have tissues with different stiffness. And uh, evaluating this part and that because uh, tissues must be uh, with the a proper uh, stiffness to have a, a functionality. Cells on stiff substrates. Uh, is spread and differentiate into osteoblasts. However, on soft substrate, the cells remain round and differentiate into adipocytes. However, the shear stiffness depends on the intrinsic elastic modulus, but also on the extracellular matrix geometry. Tusan and collaborators found that osteosarcoma cells are able to sense through soft matrices and deeper when acting collectively. 
We hypothesize that bone marrow stroma cells will spread more and differentiate into osteoblasts on soft polyacrylamine hydrogels when decreasing hydrogels thickness. To test this, we fabricated polyacrylamine hydrogels of different stiffness and thickness. We measured these properties and evaluated their effect on cell spreading, proliferation, and differentiation. And we also evaluated hydrogels deformations. That bone marrow stroma cells are sensitive to mechanical changes as they spread more on stiffer substrates and soft gels uh, when decreasing the thickness. Also, the cell morphology was modified. Acting stress uh, fibers can be clearly seen on cells on stiff substrates, regardless of the thickness, while on uh, the cells on uh, soft substrates don't have these uh, clear fibers and focal additions. However, the thickness modified the cell length of the cells. After confirming the osteogenic differentiation potential of these cells on uh, tissue cortoplastic, we found that bone marrow stroma cells can also differentiate into osteoblasts uh, when changing hydrogels thickness on soft gels. We can clearly see uh, that uh, it's proliferated more on thinner gels and they also uh, increase their uh, proliferation, uh, their osteogenic capacity on soft thicker gels. We confirm depth sensing by quantifying hydrogels deformations immediately after seeding. The cells start uh, sensing the mechanical properties and creating hydrogel displacements both on stiff and soft gels being rated on soft thick gels, as we can see on the video on the side three channel. We also evaluated in the relation between depth sensing and osteogenic differentiation by evaluating hydrogel displacements under basal and osteogenic conditions. We found that cells still deform soft gel to a greater extent, uh, being greater on thicker gels in comparison to soft thin gels, and the deformation were uh, smaller under osteogenic conditions, and uh, the stiff gels were hardly deformed uh, regardless of the media conditions. So far, we have confirmed that substrate elastic modulus and substrate thickness promote cell spreading, influences cell morphology and focal additions formations. And more importantly, we, we found that bone marrow stroma cells proliferation and osteogenic differentiation is linked to depth sensing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maria. Yes. Uh, our, our next speaker is uh, Paula San Juan Alberti from the University of Nottingham. And she's going to talk about 3D bioprinting of conductive extracellular matrix structures towards cardiac tissue engineering. Thank you. And you can hear me now, sorry, apologize, I was muted. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction, Jennifer. And as you said, I'm gonna be talking about some work that we're doing in the bioprinting of conductive matrix structures. Um, just to give you an overview about um, the solar matrix, this material is quite interesting in bioprinting applications because it possesses tissue-specific biochemical features. That means that the composition of the external matrix is uh, varies from tissue to tissue, and they are quite specific. Uh, the mechanical properties are also quite similar to the different. We can also tune this material to fit specific applications. And also, importantly from, for my work, we can easily process this material for uh, 3D bioprinting applications. In our case, we worked with three different tissues, small intestines, mucosa, liver, and bone. And we decelerized these three different tissues using chemical and biochemical and physical methods. 
And once we decelerized it, we characterized the glycosaminoglycans and DNA content. And we've seen that our GAG content was quite high, which is good because it means that the uh, structural proteins are still uh, present in, in our matrix. Uh, also, the DNA content is quite low, which is also good because it means that we have effectively removed the cells from our tissues. And regarding the biotin preparation, what, we, what we've done is we've solubilized these uh, matrices and we combine them with human-induced pluripotent stem cell direct adamycytes and also multiple carbon nanotubes, which in our case will act as conductive nanofillers and will increase the conductivity of our materials. And once we formulate our inks, we process them using a bioprinter. The technique that we use for bioprinting is called fresh extrusion bioprinting. So fresh stands for free form reversible embedding of suspended hydrogels. And the main difference between fresh and conventional extrusion bioprinting is that in our case, we print our materials inside a gelatin support valve. This is because the viscosity of our inks are quite low. So the gelatin bath allow us to retain the shape of our structures and avoid the structures to collapse. So what we do is we print inside the gel. And once the structure is fully built, we wait for the in-situ gelation. We use the gelation of the structures in situ inside the gelatin bath. And then we increase the temperature to 37 degrees to melt the gelatin microparticles and then release our structures. Um, as you can see here in this example, using this method and these inks, we can print relatively complex structures. We've also um, studied the kinetics of the gelation to understand when our materials are fully gelated and when we are able to remove the, gel the gelatin. So as you can see here, after 20 to 30 minutes, the structures are fully gelated and we are able to remove the gelatin bath. Our, structure, our structures are also relatively stable, so they retain the shape for up to 60 days. And as you can see in this video here, we can manipulate the structures quite easily. So they are not very fragile, they are relatively robust. Regarding the material characterization, we've uh, studied the conductivity of these materials in both dry and wet conditions. And we've seen that uh, in both cases, when we have the CNTs, they took the conductivity of the hydrogens increases. We've also noticed something quite interesting, and that is that when we have the CNTs in these bioinks in the presence of the matrix, we've seen an increase in the thickness of the fibers of collagen. And we are not entirely sure why this is happening. This is a phenomenon that we are currently investigating. Just to conclude, we've done also some preliminary studies on the cardiomyocytes after bioprinting, and we've seen that for the three tissues, the cardiomyocytes are quite viable, the availability is above 80%. That's everything from me. Thank you very much for your attention, and I just want to acknowledge all the people involved in this, in this project. Thank you. Lovely, thank you so much. Um, right, we'll move on to our next speaker, who is going to be Melissa Rayner from University College London, talking about engineered neural tissue made using clinical grade human neural stem cells supports regeneration in a critical gap length nerve injury. Thank you. Hi, thank you everyone. I have a quick opportunity to thank the organisers for giving me the opportunity to do this talk. So I'm going to give a brief overview of the project I've been working on, which explored the use of engineered neural tissue made using therapeutic stem cells in supporting regeneration in a critical gap length nerve injury. But peripheral nerve injury is extremely debilitating to patients and causes damage to the end target organ. So, for example, this can cause a loss of sensation in the skin or function in the muscle. And currently, the only treatments available are microsurgical. So following an injury, the two severed stumps need to be brought back together to allow regeneration. So sometimes this could be done simply by the surgeon suturing the stumps back together. However, in most cases, uh, there is usually a gap and therefore this needs to be bridged. 
This is when the gold standard autograft is used. So an autograft is where the surgeons will take the patient's own nerve tissue from an alternative site and use this to bridge the gap. This acts to provide native nerve tissue, but also most importantly, the Schwann cells to aid regeneration. However, as I'm sure you can understand, there are limitations to this method, including donor site morbidity and limited availability. Therefore, there is a clear clinical need to develop an artificial alternative to the autograft. So our lab has been working to overcome this problem through the development of engineered neural tissue or NGNT for short. So NGNT, as shown here, consists of aligned therapeutic cells. So, for example, the Schwann cells in a collagen matrix in sheathed by a collagen membrane. So therefore, the aim of my study was to test whether um, NGNT could be used as an alternative to the autograft. So previously, the lab has published some really promising results for the use of NGNT back in 2018. And so I wanted to do a follow up study to determine uh, whether NGNT could be of benefit in a critical size gap injury. So this study was a statistically powered preclinical study with an extended time point and is currently in preprint for publication. So for this study, I built NGNT containing human neural stem cells, which are being investigated clinically for other indications by the company Renurum. The NGNT was then in sheathed in a collagen membrane, and then this was implanted into a 50 millimeter gap injury in the sciatic nerve of a thymic nude rat. So moving on to the results, so the outcome measures that we used were histology to look at axon regeneration, and electrophysiology for functional recovery. So when looking at the total axon number up here in graph A, we can see that there was a higher number of axons in the autograft in comparison to the NGNT at eight weeks. However, when looking at the particular proportions of these axons, there was a higher number of motor fibres in the NGNT group in comparison to the autograft. This also corresponded to an increase in the compound muscle action potential in the NGNT group. However, as you can see at 16 weeks, um, the results were the same between both groups in all outcome measures. However, in conclusion, our data does suggest that NGNT could potentially be used as an alternative off the shelf therapy uh, to autographs for treatment in peripheral nerve gap injuries. So very much for listening and please come and take a look at my poster if you'd like any more information or if you have any questions. Thank you. Brilliant, thank you Melissa. Uh, we're, going, we're going to move on to the final speaker in our uh, Turbo Talks and we're going to hear from Priyanka Gupta from the University of Surrey is going to talk about a chemotherapeutic assessment on a novel scaffold assisted multicellular model of pancreatic cancer. Uh, hi everyone, um, thank you for attending my talk. So I am Priyanka and as Jennifer mentioned that I'm going to talk about chemotherapeutic assessment on a novel scaffold assisted multicellular model of pancreatic cancer. So a bit of an overview about uh, pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma, which is the most common form of pancreatic cancer. It is the fourth leading cause of cancer-related deaths worldwide, and it has a very dismal five-year survival rate of about 9%. Specifically in the UK, you have about 8,000 cases uh, every year. Uh, one of the key uh, reasons that uh, PDAC is uh, such a debilitating disease with such a low survival rate is because it has a, we have a very low understanding of how it progresses. And uh, this cancer has a very high resistance to currently available treatment methods, including chemotherapy and radiotherapy. And a lot of this is attributed to PDAC's complex tumor microenvironment, which contains a plethora of cells and ECM matrix proteins. And as with most uh, tumors, an accurate in vitro 3D model is of high importance for acquiring a better understanding of what PDAC uh, is doing in the body, how it progresses, and if there are ways to sort of um, find out uh, for the betterment of the current treatment methods or to see uh, how novel treatment methods work. So in our group at the University of Surrey and now with UCL, we have developed a polyurethane scaffold-based model of PDAC. Uh, 
Uh, these uh, scaffolds are prepared by thermal induced phase separation methods and they are highly porous 3D structures. They are quite elastic, they are biocompatible and we are able to perform uh, ECM mimicry via simple surface-based modification with uh, proteins like collagen and fibronectin. In our previous publications, what we have shown is that uh, if you have pancreatic cancer cells on these polyurethane scaffolds, you ha can have long-term culture of uh, PDAC up to almost five weeks. You have proliferating cells which are viable, forming cellular masses. You see expression of HIF1-alpha in them, uh, secretion of collagen-1 protein by the cancer cells itself. And we have also shown that these models uh, of uh, monocellular models can be used for uh, treatments um, using both chemo and radiotherapy. However, it is well known that as with most cancers, PDAC is not made up of just cancer cells, rather it is a complex model with uh, various other cells. Specifically, you have the pancreatic stellate cells, um, which is quite important, and also you have the endothelial cells. So what we have gone ahead and done is that we have developed a multicellular model of PDAC wherein we have pancreatic cancer cells, we have stellate cells, and we have microvascular endothelial cells to mimic the presence of blood cells. Uh, as you can see here in the images, um, we tested out two different protein coatings on our um, polyurethane scaffolds. On the top panel, you have fibronectin coated scaffolds, and on the bottom panel, you have collagen one scaffolds with the three cells in different uh, permutation combinations. And to cut a, short, a long story short, what we find out is that when you have a fibronectin coated uh, scaffold, pancreatic cancer cells uh, survive better in comparison to the stellate cells and the endothelial cells. Uh, uh, just to sort of clarify here, the yellow cells are uh, the cancer cells, the red ones are the endothelial cells, and the green ones are the stellate cells. Uh, if you have a collagen coating, then uh, the stromal cells, which we consider the stellate cells and the endothelial cells, survive much better than the cancer cells. So what we concluded from this particular system is that we need a system where we have cancer cells for the pancreatic can uh, We need fibronectin coating for the cancer cells, sorry. And we need collagen coating for um, the stromal cells, which is the endothelial cells and the stellate cells. So what we did is we went ahead and did a cocktail of fibronectin and collagen one coating and we coated our cells uh we coated the scaffolds and we put our cells on them followed by four weeks of culture and um post four weeks of culture we treated them with uh 50 micromolars of gentricidin this particular uh, concentration of the drug was selected based on our previous publication if you are interested we can discuss it later and uh, we then did a post-treatment analysis 24 hours later, which included live dead analysis, as well as mm, checking with, for the presence of apoptotic marker, which is caspase in this case. And what we saw is that you do have uh, dead cells present in uh, both the monocellular system and the multicellular system 24 hours post-treatment, suggesting that the chemotherapy was working, as well as quite a num large number of apoptotic cells. On uh, doing an image-based uh, quantification of the live dead area and the caspase positive number of cells, what we see is that you have a significant downregulation of cells in both the monocellular and uh, multicellular systems in terms of live cells, and you have a higher number of apoptotic cells in both cases. However, uh, we were unable to see any kind of difference between the monocellular and the multicellular system as a whole. Uh, what we have to keep in mind is that in the multicellular system, when we are doing a TAPI analysis or a live dead, we do not know what percentage of population uh, of the different cell types you have here. So currently what we are trying to do is we are doing a cell-specific marker analysis to see what is the percentage of uh, uh, cell survival for the different cell types. Additionally, we are also doing long-term assessment of um, post-treatment uh, scenario. So we are doing day seven and longer uh, assessments to see what is happening there. Uh, in addition to this, we also have developed a dual scaffold-based uh, model where you have a separate cancer uh, compartment and a stromal compartment. And we are also carrying out similar uh, treatment to see uh, if the presence of two separate compartments for the two separate uh, for the cancer cells and the stromal cells does uh, any kind of difference in the treatment analysis. With this, I would like to thank you all for your attention. And if you are interested to know more about what our group is doing with PDAC models, please do visit my poster, which is poster number 13. 
and my colleague Gabriella's poster, which is poster number five. Thank you for all your attention. Thank you very, very much. And um, we are going to move to the Q&A session, but I think before that, I would just like to say, I think everybody did a, a fantastic job of summarizing their research. And it, it also shows the, the wide a variety of different things that we've got going on, um, certainly today and also going into uh, tomorrow as well. So lots and lots of great things happening uh, across the tissue engineering field at the moment. So. I think what we're going to do is we're going to bring all the students back um, and we're going to have a Q&A. So as I can see, there are some questions coming in, which is great. If anybody has any more questions, please feel free to add them to the chat. And remember as well that you can also contact these speakers uh, through the platform as well if, if you have specific other questions for them. So wonderful. So we have everybody back now. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through the, the chat and we'll pick some questions to ask. So I'm going to go straight to, I think there was some coming in for Maria about gel thicknesses. So Maria, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Great. So we've got a, a question from David Chow here who's looking at, you know, first of all, saying excellent talk, um, lots of impact for in terms of coating substrates, but have you identified what an optimal thickness is for the cells in terms of the cell behaviour? So what it's uh, interesting is that uh, we know that the stiff substrates are the ones that uh, promote osteogenic differentiation, but what it's important here is that we also confirm that soft substrates are able to promote osteogenic differentiation and uh, the changes in thickness, uh, they are important because we have um, a different location of uh, the cross-linking and therefore the, the amount of uh, the collagen we are attaching and therefore the number of cells we are attaching to the, to the material. So in this case, uh, I have identified that um, in contrast to our uh, hypothesis that uh, soft thin gels will promote osteogenic differentiation, we have found that uh, the soft thin uh, gels are the ones that promote proliferation, but the thicker gels promote uh, differentiation. And this will happen because we have um, the distribution of the cross linker just on the surface, on the soft thick gel, and therefore we are promoting uh, the uh, differentiation of the cells. So it's interesting, and what we have seen is um, just the, the formations the cells are uh, generating on the hydrogels, and we haven't evaluated a migration but it's, it's uh, interesting to see how they interact in the same way with the, with the biomaterial and also that this um, osteogenic fate may be related to the mechanosensing uh, properties. Great, thank you, thank you very much, Maria, great answer. Um, I'd like to move now to uh, Priyanka, and this is a question from Elaine Emerson. Um, so Elaine's saying this is a really nice multicellular model that you have. Have you considered innervation is important to pancreatic uh, cancer progression? And if so, is there a way to include neuronal stimulation or mimicry in your multicellular model? Uh, thank you for the question. So it's indeed a very good question, and it's an area, and it's an area which is like the newest thing in PDC as of now. So to be honest, we haven't really tried uh, addition of neural uh, components to the model yet. Uh, one of the key reasons is like we wanted to go one step at a time. So at this point, we are we were most more focused on the desmoplastic reaction. But I think if we have to add neuronal uh, component to the system, we would have to make certain structural changes in um, 
in the scaffold itself sort of to have a conduit like structure where the neural cells can go in and then we can uh, put some neuronal cells in there but it is a, something that we will have to think in future and yes it is uh, turning out with the recent researches with recent papers is uh, papers coming out in 2020 and 2021 that neuronal cells are important for pdac's progression so it is indeed quite a good area to look at thank you brilliant thank you um i think now we'll move to um, melissa uh, and melissa this is another question from elaine so do you know if there is interaction between neurons and resident infiltrating immune cells such as macrophages um, in vivo nerve regeneration is this a method or model to mimic that in your engineered tissue it's a really interesting question yes yeah, so there is plenty of um, literature that, that has suggested that immune cells do have a role within peripheral nerve regeneration for it to be successful there is a really complex kind of interaction between all the cell types following peripheral nerve injuries and we do know that macrophages from previous um studies that we've done we actually do look at macrophages to see actually the infiltration of them following the injury as well as the innate um, macrophages to see what kind of role they have. We didn't particularly do it in this study, unfortunately, um, just because our primary outcomes were really more just to see if we could get regeneration of functional recovery in a critical gap length. Um, but in a very similar study that we've done um, in our literature, we did see that there is actually an increase in the macrophages that infiltrate. We've also, within our, um, our lab, we do a lot of work with some small molecules to determine like their kind of relationship with the cell types present. And we've found um, some preliminary data, which we're actually working on at the moment, to actually say that some of the small molecules that we're testing actually have an impact on these immune cells as well. So maybe watch this space and maybe hopefully in the future we'll have some work um, published on that for you. Sorry, I'm just hearing in, in my ear that we're running short on time. So what we'd like to do now um, is move on to Uni with uh, Karine because she was kind of cut off earlier. And you know, thank you to all of our students who've attended. I know that there are outstanding questions, um, but please visit the students' posters and contact them on the platform if you have particular questions. I think that's a real advantage of this interactive platform that we can um, go to you know, directly to people if we have questions. So we'll, we'll move back to Karine now. Karine, hopefully you can hear me now. Yes, I can. <laughs> so fantastic, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, I was I was in the midst of saying what a fantastic talk that you had given and it was, it was lovely, um, but I, I don't know what the technical issues were at that stage. So if anybody else has any questions, that we can send to Karine. I know that we had some um, in the chat. Unfortunately, they seem to have disappeared at this point. Um, so if anybody has any more, then please write them in the chat now. Um, I did actually have a few, if I could okay. just start and wait wait for yes. people to, to come in. Um, so, I mean, it was a beautiful talk. And you've got so many lovely techniques and, and stunning images. I was... I was really captivated by your video at the start where you have your your spontaneously contracting scaffold um what what's the what's the frequency there is is that something that you can even is that something you can control yeah this is a great question um i think this relates a lot to the questions that we've been hearing and the talks that we've had in the session in terms of the biology of the system and what are your readouts and how complex do you have to create your model in order to be able to you know, discover something that actually is biologically relevant. Um, some of the other work in our lab is looking at these engineered cardiac tissues for uh, like in vitro cardiotoxicity assessment, right? And in that field, beating rate is used as one of the physiological metrics. Um, beating rate in iPS-derived cardiomyocytes is a little bit of a dubious metric. So you also have to be careful, right? Uh, these are stem cell-derived cardiomyocytes. They're immature. Ventricular cardiomyocytes in the adult are highly quiescent, right? They're supposed to be the followers of the pulse that comes from the atria through the AV node and the Purkinje system. So um, really, if we're making true ventricular tissues, which now we are determining subtype, at least ventricular and atrial, 
um, then we should have a fully quiescent tissue, which is not what you saw. Um, so beating rate is typically um, around half a hertz to one hertz, um, which is a slow resting human heart rate, right? We can pace these tissues and we can get up to about three hertz, which at 180 beats per minute is about exercise heart rate. Mm -hmm. um, and there are some groups that are trying to do a pacing regimen, right, for exercise. Like you see this in um, uh, Melissa Radisic's work and Gordana Vunyak Novakovic's work. Um, and you can get these cells to follow much faster, sort of suprahuman heart rates. Um, and that, I think, speaks to the plasticity of a stem cell derived cardiomyocyte, right? They're highly plastic, they can respond to the environment. And, and that's exactly why knowing what extracellular matrix they're in, knowing what the electrical and the mechanical microenvironment is, is really important to the biological function of these cells. Um, so, you know, we typically do have these slower, spontaneous beating rates. In fact, when we add the 5% human cardiac fibroblasts, we can get ventricular tissues that are uh, quiescent. So they have very rare, spontaneous beats. So, um, the beating activity is also temperature dependent. You take them out of the incubator and they slow down. So you have to be very careful with how you're making these measurements and, and sort of what you're doing with them. Um, we like to look at paced responses because when we're stimulating and we're pacing, we can actually make uh, measures of the kinetics um, of the action potential, calcium transient, as well as contractility. Um, and those kinetics really matter. They are frequency dependent. Um, and, and a number of the measurements that we try to make are in the physiological range. So we often go with a one hertz frequency, whether that's a, a stretch or a, a pacing uh, electrically. Um, and so, you know, I, I think that this, this session has really touched on the question of, you know, biological relevance. And, and that's really what I'm seeing as super important across the field um, when we're talking about developing, you know, engineered solutions with our, our biomaterials and our cells is, is how does it relate to, to the physiology that, that we want to learn about? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I wholeheartedly ag agree with that. And um, my, my background as well is, is anatomy. So as, a, as well as that, I'm always looking to, to try and recapitulate anatomical structures and I think it's even more important that we we look across all these things and and harness that real relevance to the models that we're producing yeah. um yeah fantastic thank you so much and I'll extend my my thanks out to all the speakers in this session it's been a really lovely session to chair and um I would just encourage everybody to please interact with others. I know this is a, a virtual conference, but we really want to try and push the interaction as much as we possibly can. Please visit uh, the sponsors. Please visit the, the, the poster booths. Uh, it's really important that, that you see all of what is going on uh, in, the, in the full two days that we have. So just a, a, a massive thank you to everybody. Uh, thanks to our sponsors for this session, which were Biotech. Uh, but on that note, I think I'll, I will close this session and I think there's a, a short break before the next session begins. So thank you very much, everyone, and enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs>